Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again. We just had a homegrown series yesterday, so uh, welcome back if you had attended um, then. Uh, this program, the Homegrown Lecture Series, is brought to you by Texas A&M AgriLife Extension in Harris County. Uh, you see up on your screen our new quarter, October, November, and December, so we're closing out the year. And uh, just to go over everything that we're going to be offering uh, in the next few months, uh, we will have creating a combination planter with uh, Paul Winsky, citrus trees uh, by me, Brandy Keller. Uh, Shannon Dietz will come back with So You Want to Be a Rancher, uh, one of the most enticing titles we have. Well, that's, that's in December. It goes across. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm just going through them. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and then Sausage Making 101 by Shannon. Rainwater Harvesting will be brought to you by uh, Miss Ma uh, Harris County Master Gardener Teresa C. And then Back to Making Holiday Plants Last um, by myself. Uh, anyway, we also have a podcast, so if you uh, are registering for these, you'll get that email and take a listen at our um, on with some of the podcasts that we have. I think we have three or, or four now. So today we uh, have Shannon Dietz, the uh, Harris County Ag Agent, and he is going to be talking about flavored butters. So welcome, Shannon. Thank you, Brandy. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name, like uh, Brandy said, is Shannon Dietz. I'm the County Ag Agent, Harris County with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. And uh, we're going to have a fun program lined up for you today. Um, and so a lot of you who probably watched some of my presentations in the past, um, welcome again. Those who are new to the program, uh, welcome to you. Uh, we have uh, a lot of fun doing these uh, free educational programs to the public, um, not just here in Texas, but um, basically worldwide since we're we're via um, the internet. So um, we're always happy to welcome visitors from near and far. So uh, if you're from out, we'll, we'll try something different today. If you're from outside the state of Texas, go ahead and type it in the chat box and uh, let us know where you're watching from today. And um, to, um, uh, to get the show started, we're, we're gonna be talking about um, flavored butters, but um, in addition to that, we are going to, there we go, um, giving you a little bit of information about the dairy industry um, and what goes into dairy products and how important the dairy industry is to our economy here in Texas and in the United States. Uh, we, we hear a lot about beef and uh, beef, uh, you know, steaks, um, you know, uh, different cuts of beef, and we don't normally think about dairy, uh, you know, other than when we're in the dairy aisle of the grocery store, uh, when we're picking up a, a gallon of milk or half gallon, or we're picking up some yogurt or cheese or what have you. So uh, we're going to pay a little bit more attention to the dairy industry today. And uh, I have a special guest in the audience today. Uh, she came all the way out from the field. You see her here. Uh, this is Butter the Dairy Cow. And uh, she's going to be my special guest today. And uh, she's going to share some information with you. And we're going to uh, chit chat and hopefully answer some questions that you might have about the dairy industry. And obviously, at, at the end, uh, don't give up on us because we will be getting to it eventually. Uh, we're going to be sharing some recipes with you on com compound butter or otherwise known as flavored butter. Uh, and so you're going to want to stick around to the very end for those. And um, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started and start our interview with uh, Miss Butter, the dairy cow. And we're going to kind of go over a couple um, high points that we're going to talk about today and um, some of our interview questions that we're going to ask Butter is going to be, uh, we're going to talk about the history of the dairy industry in America um, and how it's played an important role in um, increasing uh, vitamin intake and nutrient intake in both young and old people 
Um, a lot of people don't think about um, that on a daily basis. Why dairy? Uh, we're going to go over some fun dairy form facts and benefits of dairy. Um, de some dairy uh, frequently asked questions. And then we're going to kind of um, talk a little bit about the difference between a beef and a dairy cow. Um, I've done presentations on beef cattle before. Um, and you might have been around for some of those. If not, you can always go back on our YouTube channel um, and check some of those out. Uh, but we're going to be, um, I'm going to explain the difference today um, between those two. And then we're going to talk a little bit about butter versus margarine. And then last but not least, like I said, butter or compound butter and the many options that are out there. All right, so this is, like I said, this is going to be a very fun, uh, interactive presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, I'll take questions from throughout the presentation. Um, Paul and Brandy are handling the, the, the questions on the back end, so feel free to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, if I have the answer to them, I will definitely share those with you, but if I need to get in touch with one of our specialists and uh, and get some clarification on the answer and so forth. But um, we're going to have a lot of fun today. And um, so sit back and enjoy the presentation. First part is we're going to talk about a little bit about the dairy industry um, and how butter the dairy cow came to be important role in um, United States agriculture. Um, you know, like I said, we, we pay a lot of attention to beef cattle industry and so forth because we're here in Texas. Texas is the number one beef cattle producer in the United States. So uh, that takes prominence to a lot of things. We, we talk a lot of things beef, we talk barbecue, we talk brisket, uh, we talk steaks and different things like that. But we forget about the cousin to the beef cattle, which is the dairy cow um, and how it really got started here in the United States. Back in the early 1600s, European settlers uh, came in and brought their dairy cows with them. Um, they were a dual purpose breed. You don't hear that a lot in the beef industry. Dual purpose breeds are um, breeds of cattle that can provide both uh, milk and meat. OK, so uh, obviously you can't get that from a beef cattle, uh, a beef cow, but you can definitely get it from a dairy cow. So um, that that's one of the things there. And then um, cattle were also dairy cows were also introduced into lower California and brought up by the missionaries and the Spaniards when they started um, migrating in from Mexico and so forth. So that's how we got started on the on the West Coast and on the East Coast. They came in from the European immigrants. Um, about the 1800s, there started to be breeds that were developed for milking purposes and so forth. So um, you had breeds that were primarily, you still had the dual purpose breeds and so forth, but you had breeds of dairy that were predominantly known for milk producing capabilities or high milk producing capabilities. And we've come a long way in the dairy industry and the ag industry through um, Land Grant Universities. <clears throat> who deal in dairy, large dairy cattle farms and so forth like that. As far as lowering, lowering the carbon footprint um, on from the dairy cattle industry and in the beef cattle industry, your cattle industry in general, uh, where you we're producing more milk and more beef now with less water, uh, less land usage, more conservation practices and so forth. So uh, our our researchers and our farmers work closely together on this, uh, taking care of the environment. We know that there are limited supplies for a lot of things that go around, a lot of resources that go around. So we also want to make sure that our animals that we rely on for nutrient value and so forth are kept up um, and they are cared for at the same time. So uh, we're always looking to produce more with less cattle. Um, and, and we'll talk about that more as we go along in the presentation and so forth. You know, one of the things that we always uh, remember were the old Norman Rockwell pictures of um, the milkman driving the little milk cart through rural um, America and dropping off his little crate of uh, fresh, uh, fresh um, 
fresh milk from the farm that morning and the glass containers, the glass drawers and everything and go and drop them off on the porch and everything. And that was kind of like, you know, a really neat memory of that time and so forth. But as uh, more people moved from the rural setting into the city setting, obviously you had a lot more people uh, that milk had to be brought to. And so that brought up the fact of both urbanization and how uh, it became necessary to produce more milk and improve the quality of milk at the same time. So um, one of the major things that that helped in that transfer or that that um, I guess the fact of making milk more readily available was the, the fact of pasteurization. Um, and if pasteurization kind of sounds a little bit familiar to me, you, it was uh, created by Louis Pasteur and Pasteur pasteurization. And basically pasteurization is the quick heating of a liquid like milk um, at a hot, very high temperature and it kills those uh, uh, pathogens and bacteria and so forth that can't survive. And it's usually like only two or three seconds or so forth like that. And that basically extends the shelf life. So um, that's why you see um, used by date of and so forth because from the time it shipped from the the dairy the dairy itself from when it gets to the consumer in the shelves at heb or kroger or whatever you're going to always see that uh, that used by date and so forth and you see that on a lot of uh perishable products now uh, not only milk but cheese yogurts uh, many of your dairy products, and you're also going to find it on many of your meat products and so forth. So uh, if you've never paid attention to that before, make sure that you look at that uh, because a lot of times um, grocery stores are known for moving the, the, the product that expires earlier up to the front, and it could be within a day or two, and those are going to be the quickest that you pull from whenever you do go shopping. Um, so just make sure you always check that use by date and so forth. Here's a couple of pictures here that um, I found on the internet and uh, it just kind of shows you the urbanization, I guess, and the mechanization of how the ag industry has really come um, to where we are today. Um, you see the first picture up on the top left is the Mary milking machine, which was the first um, patented milking machine uh, on two really skinny dairy cows there. Uh, they don't have much udder on them. Um, and just to clarify, um, so the terminology that we use in the dairy industry, and I'm not a dairy person by any means or anything, but uh, I have taken quite a few animal science classes. So uh, the bag uh, that holds the milk, the raw milk on the cow, the dairy cow is called the udder and um, it's usually pretty veiny and you'll see some pictures you can see the difference between the udder on the top picture and some of them on the bottom picture and um, they have teats t-e-a-t-s um, usually four to five of them on each udder and that's where they um, clip on the uh, automated milking machines that you see down at the bottom picture it's very uh industrialized um it's very computerized now. I mean, it is state of the art. You go in these um, milking barns and everything's stainless steel, everything's spick and span. Um, they take the quality of their product very highly and very seriously uh, because everything is monitored by USDA, United States Department of Agriculture. So they want to make sure that the consumer is getting uh, the best quality product that can be out there. So there's never going to be any question that whenever it comes to the point of a sale and for a consumer at the grocery store that there's any questionable practices or anything like that. So, um, and you can see now that's a whole round of cows. It's hard to, it's hard to see from that picture, but there's probably at least 100 to 150 cows in that round that are getting milked at one time, as opposed to going out there by hand, um, and you still have some dairy farms that are up in the northeast and um, the north, like Wisconsin and areas like that. Some of your niche farmers, your more specific farmers that might have 30 to 40 cattle, uh, dairy cows in one barn or something, 
and they have a, a, a family operation and they might still get out there and do some hand milking um, and especially like churning of the butter by hand and different things like that. But uh, on a much larger scale, uh, to be able to keep up with the supply and the demand for milk and uh, milk products, dairy products and so forth, uh, this needs to be done on a much larger scale like you see down in the bottom picture. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about why dairy is important. And I just pulled two really areas that I thought might jump out to the crowd at the most. Um, for one is bone health. We've always, from 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 being a little child, I remember growing up, you know. Um, hey, Shannon. Yes. Let, let me, before you go on to this, um, we got a question here. Oh, okay. Regarding, I guess, the milking and things like that. And sure. Uh, the question is, is this uh, a humane treatment of the cattle? Yes, it is. Uh, everything, um, the there is no pain involved in the milking machines. Um, everything is very sanitized. It actually provides a release for the dairy cattle because um, their udder can only hold so much milk. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later on, but there's no harm. There's no pain involved or anything like that. Uh, it's strictly monitored uh, by USDA, um, and I mean, the whole process of cattle actually, or dairy cows from the barns uh, to the milking process, they're treated like, like queens in the barn. Um, they have fans, they have misters constantly blowing on them. They have constant, um, they can be in the barn uh, when it's inclement weather outside. They can be outside free range if they choose to do so and everything, so yes. There's no pain and it's a very humane uh, process. OK, thanks. OK, so yeah, bone health. Um, why dairy is important, you know, uh, my mom and dad were always like, you know, you don't want to break a bone or anything, so make sure you drink plenty of milk. Uh, you know, we were I, I don't really know how I, we probably could have started a dairy from the amount of milk that we drank at our house. Uh, so there was myself. And I had two brothers and my dad, and milk was just the common drink in the house. Uh, we always had dairy products, milk and cheese and butter. And um, I remember growing up that my mom would buy at least three gallons of milk a week, uh, just because that's what we drank for our meals. And we didn't really have Coke products or anything like that. And we drank water as well, but milk was just a drink of choice there. And it really helped us out, I think. Um, you know, we don't have a problem with bone density or anything. Uh, I've never had a broken bone in my body, so knock on wood, uh, you know, uh, for what it's worth, but that just kind of goes along with that. And it usually starts at nine years old when that proper bone development really starts to kick in. Um, and then it helps later on in life for older adults when we talk about osteoporosis and everything. So uh, you still want to, if you can't drink milk, Make sure you take the calcium supplements and so forth, but getting it um, natural milk uh, with all the nutrients and everything involved with it is always more uh, the better way to go if you can. Then uh, butter the dairy cow says three servings a day. I say uh, three servings of dairy foods like milk, yogurt, or cheese in those nine years and older contribute to healthy eating styles. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the 13 essential nutrients that she's talking about here in our next slide. And you can see they kind of run the gamut. Some of those, you, some of these you probably you hear on a daily basis. Uh, some of them you might not hear so much about. Um, but, you know, um, like our protein, our calcium, potassium, vitamin D, zinc, vitamin A and riboflavin. Those in the first category, you, you pretty much hear on a daily basis. And you can see those daily values from um, a glass of <clears throat> a glass of milk, excuse me. And then um calcium is pretty high there the riboflavin you know using your body carbohydrates fats and proteins for some uh, fuel 30 percent daily value there uh vitamin d supports strong bones so we're getting back to that calcium supplement all the time and then we move over to the second category look at vitamin b12 50 percent of daily value this supports normal blood function and the nervous system you know just from a glass of milk how can you beat that Glass of milk, all natural, 
no uh, hormones, no additives involved or anything like that. It's one of the purest uh, foods out there and so forth. And then iodine, 60%. Uh, niacin, uh, energy metabolism in the body. Um, so it's really great. Uh, you know, for those people who are lactose intolerant, there is a variety of milks that are out there now. Um, you have everything from lactose free, um, which uh, the body can't uh, work with the lactase uh, and, uh, enzyme. So that's what causes that lactose intolerance. Uh, can't break it down or anything like that. So there's a variety of milks out there um, from dairy cows and also from um, your soys, your almond milks, your, uh, your coconut milks and different things like that. So I would encourage you to read the labels on any dairy products you use or you consume for you and your family and make sure that you're getting the necessarily dairy uh, daily requirements out of it just because um, it might say, um, you know, you're getting, and then also it might say that you're getting, you know, X, Y, Z vitamins out of it and everything like that, but marketing and what's on the label is two different things. And so USDA tries to monitor that on a, on a very strong, um, case by case basis, but just to make sure, you know, um, always read the label. I always tell consumers to read the label know what's going on in your body, know what you're drinking, know what you're eating and so forth like that. If it has a whole bunch of ingredients in it that you can't explain or you can't even pronounce, or if the list goes past, you know, 10 or 15 ingredients or anything in it, I mean, you're the more ingredients that's added into it, the further away from natural that you're getting, all right? So, uh, you know, we're going to talk about butter in a little bit. Butter should only have a couple ingredients in it. When you start seeing a whole bunch of ingredients in it, we're getting further and further away from butter. Um, and then we're going to talk about, uh, you know, I just want to kind of bring up the fact of like the different percentages of milk fat uh, in milk. You have whole milk, you have 2% milk, you have 1% milk, and you have uh, your skim, your low fat milk, you have butter milk, uh, which is on the highest end of the butter fat content and so forth like that. So, um, you're going to use some of those for like cooking and different um, recipes and so forth. So um, I'm kind of a 2% guy. Um, we grew up on whole milk, but I did cut back and I get still plenty of nutrients and everything from the 2%. 1% for me um, is just a little too watery. So it's really up to personal uh, preference and consumption and different things like that. So um you know what you like and 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 uh but i just want to make you aware of uh what all is out there all right so let's see um so a couple of dairy farm facts all right so i got my dairy uh cows up there on the top uh these are hosting cattle uh dairy cows and um these are all cousins of uh butter the dairy cow and you can see they all have ear tags in them. They're all registered Holsteins. Um, they are uh, very valuable pieces of, um, I wouldn't necessarily call them equipment, but resources on the farm. Uh, the farmers take very, very, very good care of these animals. Uh, they, uh, they make sure they're treated humanely. You know, um, they don't put, they don't tolerate anything uh, as far as abuse of the animals or, you know, most of the time these are family operated farms and they go back generation after generation and everybody takes it very seriously. So a um, couple of dairy farm facts. And, um, and if you know the questions to some of these, we're, I'm just gonna throw the question out there. And if you happen to know the answer, um, Put it out in the chat box. Might be some dairy farmers out there watching from Wisconsin or what have you. Uh, so feel free to chip in. But anybody know what dairy cows eat? And I'm going to give you the answer in a second. Paul, does anybody know what dairy well, cows eat? Well, there's a little delay. So you, you might want to ask a yeah. few oh, questions. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and read through the questions. Obviously, everybody can see them. But... Uh, how much 
milk does a dairy cow produce each day? Um, Going to talk about how many dairy farms are in the United States. Does it hurt a cow to be milked? We answered that one already, and I think that's a little lanyap question that we already know the answer to. Uh, what is the number one milk producing state? That was an interesting one. And what is the top? What are the top five dairy producing states? Um, and we are going to. start answering those questions. So unless there's any answers that are in the uh, the chat box, we're just going to go ahead and um, start share those answers with you. So what do dairy cows eat? Uh, they eat a combination of grain and you can see a lot of that. If you would expand the picture, if I would have expanded the picture there to feed trough, uh, they d cattle in general are very good um, processors of product that we don't want or that's not utilized in the United States, like grasses, um, a lot of pulps, a lot of um, byproducts that would normally go into uh, landfills from agronomic crops or or different things like that. Um, they've been tested and they are uh, nutritious and they are uh, highly palatable to um cattle and especially some dairy cattle um and so to answer the question there they eat also a lot of silage uh which is basically green corn um corn is grown not for the ear of the corn but to be chopped um before the stage that the corn is ready to develop and it's a really wet uh highly nutritious uh feed um, and they actually have silage borns. You'll see it up a lot in the Midwest, up in northern Texas and so forth. People cut silage and they use it in, uh, at the dairy borns and so forth. So it's, it's a very good feed. How much milk does a dairy cow produce each day? And I don't know why my, um, my notes box is not showing because that's where I had the answers, but I remember Paula Brandy, do any of y'all happen to know what I'm not? Why the notes? Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So my fault. Um, oh. Uh, how do I go back? Shoot. Go, you can hit page up. It's, it's on the arrows on the keyboard, Paul. It's not working. Yeah, yeah, you, you can page up on the keyboard should be able to do it. I'm hitting page up and it's not going. Ah, uh, shoot. Sorry about that, y'all. Let's see. OK, well, we'll we'll come to those come back to those questions, so I apologize. Um, anyway. It's not. Oh, you got to highlight my bad. OK, is that where you're at? Yep, yeah. Thanks, Paul. Sorry for the technical difficulty, y'all. Um, OK, getting back to our questions. How much milk does dairy cow produce each day? Um, 10 to uh, 15 to 20 gallons per day. All right. Um, so over a lifetime, three to four years of a dairy cow being in production at a dairy barn, uh, they can produce quite a bit of, of, of raw milk. Uh, and I say raw milk because it hasn't been pasteurized yet. Um, so until it gets pasteurized, it's not, um, it's not, USDA does not readily uh, recommend that you drink raw milk just for the safety of it and so forth like that. So it should go th through the pasteurization process. Um, there are roughly about 34,000 
uh, dairy farms in the United States. So um, it's still a pretty big industry. Uh, about 94% of the dairy farms are family owned in the United States. And so it's a strong tradition, just like with the cattle industry. Um, we do hear a lot over the news a lot lately that some of the smaller dairies are actually being sold out to larger dairy producer uh, production. Um, and um, it's unfortunate, um, you know, some of those families are looking to get out of the dairy industry. Some of them, the competition just doesn't, um, you know, if they have a smaller farm or whatever, uh, and they, they're trying to produce on a much larger scale, sometimes the supply and demand doesn't really work out. So, um, but there's still a, quite a bit of high uh, dairy farms in the United States. The number one milk producing state. Did anybody have an um, answer for that one, Paul or Brandy? Anybody want to take a guess? Y'all want to take a guess? I, I would say California. Ding, 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 ding. We got a winner. Yes, California uh, by far. Um, uh, most people don't think about California being a very big ag industry state, but it is one of the, the strongest ag industry states in the United States. We rely on California for uh, not only a lot of row crops that come out of there, um, but um, also the milk that comes out of, of California. Um, and the top five producing dairy cow states, California, um, Maryland, New York, California, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Okay, so you can see outside of California uh, and then wrapping up those, I think in the top 10, you got Idaho in there, Texas is in there in the top 10, um, and Indiana, and uh, Vermont. And so that kind of rounds up the top 10, but you see the where the majority of the cattle, uh, the dairy cow producing states are up in the Northeast part. And that's why they have barns and everything because obviously in the Northeast, they have a lot of snow each winter. So it's really fun. Uh, I wish I would have found the video. There's one video that um, gets posted every, every spring is when the cows have been um, kind of in the barn out of the element, the uh, rain elements and the snow and everything for the winter. And they come out and that grass is green and uh, they open the doors and there's a couple celebrations at a couple barns up in the Northeast and the cows come out and they kind of like really hesitant and they're really weary because they've been in the barn, you know, all winter and they're like, they open it up and it's sunshine and the grass is green and sun shining and they get out there and they just kind of like, slowly start kind of creeping through the grass and then they start jumping around like you have these 1500 pound uh dairy cattle 12 1500 pound dairy cattle just jumping around like a bunch of kindergarten kids uh playing at recess for the first time it, it's really funny it's really cool to see so i ran across this uh publication here we talked about uh texas being in the top 10 of dairy um and dairy producers we used to have a lot more dairy here in uh, Southeast Texas, there was actually a couple of dairies that were operating here in the Houston area um, that I've heard some stories about. And those are days long gone by, uh, just like the rice fields that used to be out in the Katy area and so forth. But we used to have a really big agronomic part of, in the state of Texas. Uh, but you can see there's some interesting stats, and this is from 2018, um, but 273 million um, is what the local economy or the state economy uh, contributed as far as milk production in the state. Uh, the cost of a dairy cow was about $1,115. Um, the value of a milk in one day, $9.73. And then look at that one. Cash receipts of sales of milk by dairy farmers amount to $2.2 billion with a B, not an M, with a B. So, um, there are a lot of regulations um, that affect or that the USDA uh, very w closely watches the dairy industry on. So it is a hard industry. Um, it, is, it is different than a farmer who plants row crops. Uh, any farmer who deals with cattle or any livestock, this is a 24 hour job, guys. I mean, this is hard work on these farmers. Uh, this is day and night, early mornings, late nights, uh, there's no holidays. If cattle get sick, you need to bring them to the vet or you need to take care of them yourself, you know, and different things like that. So 
um, these these farmers are very dedicated to their industry. And look, dairy uh, butter, the dairy cow is sharing some of her uh, family tree pictures with us. So uh, she wants us to know the difference about beef cows and dairy cows. Like I said, even though they are cousins to one another, you can see structurally and physically they are two different types of animals. Um, uh, one of the things that you see up right away um, that is kind of hard to miss in the picture on the dairy cows is that that big udder, that big bag of milk with those teats that we talked about. That top cow, uh, the black and white, probably the most versatile, verse recognize, most recognized uh, dairy cow that is out there. That's the Holstein cow, um, always black and white. Uh, well, not always black and white. There are versions of it, but the black and white are the most popular. And it's kind of funny because the pattern on the Holstein cow are like fingerprints. There's no two patterns alike. So it's very interesting. Um, and then the, the dairy cow right below it is a Jersey cow. Um, so the uh, Holstein cow is one of the largest, uh, weighing in about 1,500 pounds. And the Jersey cow runs about 900 pounds. It's the smallest. But the thing about the Jersey cow is they have a high butter fat uh, and protein content, which leads to higher um, quality butter and cheese and so forth. So they do, there's a lot of protein packed in that small animal. Uh, by no means, it's not a very small animal at 900 pounds, but when uh, you consider it against its cousin at 1500 pounds, it's quite a bit. And then over on the other side, you see a Holstein and a, uh, uh, no, Holstein, um, uh, you, Angus up at the top, and a Hereford down at the bottom. Um, and those are beef cow. Um, you can see structurally, you don't see the bones, you don't see the rib cage as much. Um, you don't see the vein pattern as much. You see a much more structured brisket, which is up in the front of the cattle, right below the neck uh, as it goes under the front feet and so forth. Um, these are made and these are designed for beef production, where the dairy cows, like we said, are raised for, uh, or meat, meat, um, no, um, milk production. So you can generally see the difference. Uh, most of the time when you're riding around here and you get out into the rural areas, you are gonna see beef cows. It's gonna be very rare that you see dairy cows out in the pastures here, uh, unless it's a small uh, dairy industry that hasn't um, succumbed to the economy yet and so forth. So we're going to talk a little bit about butter and margarine. We're gonna, not going to spend a little bit of time on this because I want to move on to what everybody's here for quickly. And I haven't forgot about it is those compound butters. But the difference between butter and margarine, um, I want everybody to know that, again, reading your labels on food products is very, very important. I want you to make sure that you're getting what you're buying, what, what you're buying, what you're wanting to get. Um, Butter is going to be the closest to an all natural product that you can get. It only should have uh, cream, water, uh, milk fat in it, you know, kind of type thing. Where your margarines are made with um, vegetable oils and so forth. They can be left out on the counter for longer. Um, they don't have, they both have to have 80% milk fat in them. But um, the law states and the USDA states that a lot of times margarine can be classified as spreads. So that's why you don't, if you don't see the word butter on the container or on the box that you're buying, it's not butter. All right. It's, it's been man-made. It's been produced in, in, um, in industry. Um, it's got a lot of additives. It's got a lot of preservatives. In it, and it's got uh, unfortunately, a lot of trans fats, which is not good for us. OK, so um, even though butter has a higher uh, milk fat content in it and so forth, you're not in, you're not uh, introducing those trans fats and you're not introducing a lot more oils and everything into your body that's ne necessary. So uh, and then butter is most of the time used in cooking products or baking products. Um, and so if you have any questions about those, um, I can definitely refer you to some more information on that. But just wanted to point the difference out. They are not the same uh, when you're shopping and you will definitely see a price difference. Um, and if you're buying butter on a very uh, infrequent basis, spend the money to buy some good quality butter because you can really tell the difference between 
a lower grade butter and something that you might spend a little bit more on uh, if your if your pocketbook or your wallet can afford it. Try it sometimes and um, and I, I can almost guarantee you're going to see the difference. All right, guys, we're going to we're going to show a quick video here on how uh, butter, butter the dairy cow. Her milk is taken to um, the the processor and um, is made with butter or butter is a byproduct of that 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 raw milk and so forth. So we're going to watch a video real quick and um, it's from a show how it's made. It's one of my favorite shows on TV. If you've not ever seen it before, it's a really, really cool show. They always break down a couple things that on, uh, I think it's like on the Discovery Channel or something like that. But anyway, without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and watch this video. Butter has a rich history. The ancient Romans used it as a beauty cream and to treat burns. Even the Old Testament mentions butter. Abraham served it to angels. Back then, people made butter by shaking milk in bags of animal skin or in hollow logs. Today, its glorious taste is a product of modern technology. Butter making begins with a tanker truck delivery to the dairy. 30,000 liters of raw cow's milk. Workers test it for consistent color and odor before unloading it through vacuum-pumped hoses. They pump the raw milk into a machine called a separator. The separator spins, dividing the raw milk's fat from the rest of the liquid. The fat is called buttercream, and the rest is skim milk. The essential ingredient in butter is the buttercream. It's thick, off-white, and approximately 38% fat. Some of it goes to make 2% milk. A worker adjusts a valve to reinsert some into the skim milk. The resulting 2% milk is more watery than buttercream and is white. The less the fat content, the thinner and runnier the milk is. Back to the butter making. They put the buttercream in what's called a bulk tank where mixers stir it to maintain the consistency. After pasteurizing and then aging the buttercream for 24 hours, workers prepare to transfer it into another machine called the churner. First, they clean the inside by filling it with water mixed with iodine. This removes any germs left behind by the previous batch. They spin the churner for about five minutes before rinsing it out. Next, they pour in 1,500 liters of buttercream, filling the churner about halfway. It's important to leave some room so that the air released in the churning process can escape through two vents in the churner. The churner spins at 28 rotations per minute, about the speed of a clothes dryer. This causes the buttercream's fat molecules to bunch together, releasing water and air. Every five minutes, a worker stops the churner and regulates the air vent on top. When he feels there's no more air escaping, he closes the valve and restarts the machine. After 30 minutes of churning, the fat molecules in the buttercream are creamy clumps known as popcorn butter. These clumps stay trapped in the churner, while the remaining liquid, called buttermilk, flows out a drain at the bottom. A vacuum pump system sends it through hoses to a nearby container. This draining process takes about 10 minutes and produces about 800 liters of buttermilk. This dairy uses the buttermilk to make ice cream. The popcorn butter, all 684 kilograms of it, has the same consistency as regular butter at room temperature. A worker now flavors it with 14 kilograms of salt. This dairy also makes unsalted butter. The worker closes the churner by sealing the glass window with a rubber ring and a metal collar. This keeps the internal air pressure roughly equal to what's outside the churner. Doing this ensures the churner works efficiently. Another 30 minutes of churning and the fat molecules thicken even more and blend with the salt. What results is butter, which is yellow because of its natural vitamin A. Next, a worker scoops about 30 kilograms of butter into a milling machine. 
the mill moves the butter into the final production phase, where it'll be shaped and put into packages. This machine squeezes butter into an injector that's shaped like a block. The injector then deposits blocks of butter into open packages. The packaging paper has an aluminum outer coating. This prevents light from penetrating. Light can make the butter rancid. Each sheet is 26 and a half centimeters long and 19 centimeters wide. Before the butter is inserted, a plastic former bends the paper into shape. This mill operates four days a week, churning out up to 33 blocks per minute. That's a fairly small quantity compared to some dairies. But this relatively slow pace allows greater quality control. To monitor the mill's precision, workers check every 15th block to ensure it weighs exactly 455 grams. The dairy then ships the butter to stores in refrigerated trucks. All right, so hopefully you learned a little bit something there. I thought it was a pretty interesting video and uh, just wanted to share that with you. Um, so next time you're out in, in the dairy, uh, dairy aisle, you'll know a little bit more about where your butter came from and so forth. So um, next we're moving on to what I think a lot of people are here for is about compound, compound or flavored butter. Uh, and we're here, we have a picture of a plate of various butters um, that we're going to talk about today. And, and uh, Paul and Brandy uh, have some links that they're gonna share with you with some recipes. And so uh, just kind of a couple basics uh, that we're gonna, and I, I apologize because I want to try and do this in person, but timing of it just didn't work out. But I do have a video of somebody actually preparing some compound butter. So we're gonna we're gonna go through this real quick and we're gonna share the video with you. But just a couple high points. You're always gonna wanna start, if you've never made compound butter before, you're gonna wanna start with really soft butter. Uh, do not put it in the microwave because you will get melted butter and that's not what you want, all right? You want butter that's at room temperature or you. I've actually seen people use a, put it in a mixer uh, and make, make it like a whipped butter. Um, and start from that point, but you never want to put it in the microwave. Preferably use unsalted butter to control the amount of salt, especially if you're uh, high blood pressure or any health related issues and start like that. You want to always have with a mixing bowl with a, at least a medium or a large and one cup of butter is usually a good standard to start with. That makes pretty, pretty good amount of uh, compound butter um, for the first testing. Um, and then you can kind of al always alternate, um, add more, you know, um, uh, depends on which ingredients you're going to like and stuff like that. Be creative with your ingredients. There's no right or wrong answer what you can do with compound butters as far as like adding them in. Um, your basic uh, palate is going to be the butter taste. So anything that you add outside of that is just going to enhance that flavor. Rosemary, sage, thyme. We're going to talk a lot about uh, your your natural herbs, um, garlic. Um, you know, so those are very easily incorporated in and so forth like that. And they're going to talk about that in the video. I would suggest either using parchment paper or a, a saran wrap to make your plastic roll. And you always want to refrigerate for at least two hours afterwards. Uh, to make sure that the butter actually gets set and so forth. So here's the video real quick on um, making compound butters and the lady is really, really good. And we're going to go ahead and get started too because we're we're running out of time. So. Hi, I'm Dorothy and today we're going to talk about preserving fresh herbs. Now you can preserve herbs in a lot of ways. You can make herbal salts, you can make herbal butters you can make herbal oils or you can dry them. To me, making compound butters with fresh herbs is one of the easiest and freshest ways that you can get that taste of fresh herbs in your cooking all year long. So follow me and I'll show you how easy it is. Okay, let's get started. We're starting with the butter. Make sure the most important part here is to make sure that it is softened. I prefer not in the microwave because then it gets melted. So you can use salted or unsalted butter. Today I'm using unsalted butter. So I'm adding a half teaspoon of salt to um, the garlic 
And instead of mincing the garlic, I like to um, use a mortar and pestle. It just seems like it gets more of the garlic oils out and more of the taste. And it works well in a butter. So I mixed up the salt and the garlic and I'm adding that to the softened butter. Now I'm making a Mediterranean blend right now, um, which is going to be oregano, sage, rosemary, and then the garlic. But um, in the post that you can read at farmtojar.com, um, I show you a, a blends for a Mexican butter, a Mediterranean butter, a seafood butter, and uh, what's the, oh, and a French one, uh, thin herb, or however you say it, I'm not sure. But, um, but they're all great butters and you can get really creative with these. There's no need to follow a specific recipe. Right now I'm chopping up or mincing, I should say, the oregano. Um, you wanna mince it pretty fine and you can do that in the food processor if you want, um, but it just is something else to wash. So I just take a knife, now I'm gonna do the sage and I chop it up pretty finely. I, of course, it's up to you if you want a coarsely chopped herbal butter, that's just great. By the way, these are called compound butters. Um, and there's all kinds of things you can put in with them. Popular things to add to the herbs are garlic, like I did on this one, and uh, citrus. And for the, like for the Mexican butter, I put in um, lime rind, some of the lime zest, as they say. And um, for one of the other, the seafood one, I used lemon zest. So a tablespoon each of these minced and then I put the rest of it aside to, to use later. But there's the sage. So now we've got a tablespoon of sage and a tablespoon of oregano. And now we're going to just strip the rosemary and um, chop up a tablespoon of rosemary. Now, just a note here, um, all of these herbs came from themed herbal container pots that I grew on the deck. And um, I've got two videos that you can check out. I'll put the uh, link in the upper corner here uh, of how to grow these, a beginner's guide to growing the herbs in containers on your deck or your balcony. And then one of them is, um, it's really focused on um, herbal themes. Like I cook a lot of seafood, so I wanted a seafood theme. Um, I do a lot of Mediterranean type of style food with, and so I did a Mediterranean theme. So there is the rosemary. And now we're gonna mix all that together. If you don't wanna use a, a knife and a bowl, you can chop the herbs in the food processor and you can use a stand mixer to um, mix all the butter and the herbs together. But this is the easiest and far, far less cleanup. So you do have to clean your hands, but that's about it. <laughs> All right, so I brought out about an eight and a half piece of wax paper and we're gonna make the log now. Um, they're called logs. Um, and then you cut them into what's called coins or medallions. But of course you can be creative and make any shape you want. If you want it to look like a stick of butter, go for it. Stick of butter is fine. I'm gonna make a log. So you, um, if you don't want the plastic, you can use plastic wrap, wax paper, or parchment paper. A lot of people don't like plastic on their food. So um, like I'm using the wax paper and patting it. I pat it on the top, I pat it on the sides. I kind of get it into something that I can potentially roll. As you'll see, I'm not great at rolling, but you can, um, you can make it pretty rustic and then roll it up in a, in a better way when you roll with the wax paper, as you'll see here. See, I'm not, not real good <laughs> at rolling this part, but all of these flaws can be um, eliminated when you, um, you know, mess with it a bit. Okay, so there's your log. And we're gonna freeze this and then cut it into what's called coins and use it as we go. This is important what I'm doing right now. Wipe your hands with the paper towel or you'll never be able to get 
the uh, marker to date your um, to date your compound butter log because your hands will be so greasy they'll touch the wax paper the pen won't work it's just you know make sure that you have a paper towel there so I, I'm wiping down the wax paper again also because you definitely want to label you if you make more than one compound butter you will not know what is what when you open your freezer because they look very similar so this one's the mediterranean one i'm marking it uh, as a mediterranean and i'm going to put the date and then like i said i made a mexican one a seafood one uh, a french one and then i made one that was just sage butter okay ready to go in the freezer okay the herbal butters are frozen rock solid and ready to use now when you get ready to use them um, you can put them in the fridge a little bit um, ahead of time so that they're not so hard but i find they cut pretty easily when they're frozen uh, next up we're going to do some herbal salts um, with the remaining herbs that we have out there but these turned out really nice all right, guys, so uh, that's basically the concept behind uh, creating your own uh, compound butters at home. Um, you can see it's a pretty simple process. So I've got the, the um, and um, so I encourage you to be creative and so forth. So that kind of ends our presentation today, uh, what it actually does. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit more about the dairy industry and uh, the, the economic role that the dairy industry plays in the United States and um, and learned a little bit more about like how to make your own butter. Um, you can probably you I know you can save a lot of money um, as opposed to buying already compound butter um, that usually goes for around 15 to 20 to 25 dollars sometimes upwards of a roll of specialty made butter or a pint of butter when you can create it at home for probably pennies on the dollar. Uh, just it would be the cost of um, a few herbs and um, some really good butter and you're set to go. So you're looking at uh, anywhere from 20 to 25 dollars versus, um, you know, four to five bucks or something that you would spend, especially if you have the herbs and everything already on hand. So, uh, Paul, before I start talking about the Ag Summit, do you all have any questions from the group or anything? Uh, Brandy, I don't know if you want to handle these or not, but there's two questions. Okay. Um, one is how long can you leave butter out of the refrigerator before it starts going, growing bacteria? Um, so I would leave butter out for more than an hour, um, especially if you're talking about here in the south. Um, it, it just, um, it just won't, it'll, it'll start breaking down pretty quickly um and an hour would be max um so anything more than that it probably wouldn't be safe to eat okay and then you've got one more here and this was uh based this is from lynn uh, g uh based on a uh, i don't know if you heard this story yesterday or the other day but it's about a project of training cattle to urinate in a specific area Please discuss the practicality, feasibility of this as a green effort to reduce emissions, etc. I thought the problem was methane emissions from feces, not urine. Did you hear about that at all, or I have, have you heard anything about not it? Not heard about it yet, but okay. um, I know it goes to probably like sustainable issues. Sustainable, um, you know, uh, there is. You know, there there is a lot on, on the news about the methane, you know, um, gas being emitted from cattle and so forth like that and breaking down the ozone layer and different things. But uh, the amount of methane uh, that cattle produce on a daily basis is not anywhere near. And I can send you some studies on that as far as regular emissions from um, other industry um, outside the livestock industry and everything. I know um, Farmers and USDA and all the breeds, uh, breed standards take this very seriously. Um, it's something that we can't uh, stop, but we can definitely control and help minimize. Uh, you know, there's every there's been everything from like 
uh, water intrusion, you know, uh, cleaning out manure from from barns and everything and making sure that it doesn't get in, um, you know, uh, rainwater systems and different things for people to use where they set up barriers and ponds. Um, so I'm not sure of the urination type thing. I would have to read up some more on that. Sorry. OK, uh, that is it on the question, Shannon. Yeah. All right, guys, um, while I have you on board, I want to share some information with you about the 2021 Southeast Texas Ag Summit coming up. Um, I would like to personally invite each of you uh, to attend. It's going to be sat th Thursday, September 30th and Friday, October 1st in Baytown at the Baytown Community Center uh, for the low cost of $40 a person or $60 per couple. Um, if you click on the, the QR code on that flyer, or uh, I think Paul and Brandy sending out the registration links and also the agenda of what all is going to be there. Uh, if you register by Wednesday, September 22nd, you will be eligible for a drawing for a $250 HEB grocery cord. Uh, so that's pretty great. Uh, we're going to have four educational tracks, beef cattle, pasture and range management, conservation of natural resources, farm safety and management. And if you're especially if you know of or if you are a current pesticide license holder with TDA, we are going to be offering up to five CEU credits. Uh, we will be having classes on uh, fence making, uh, grilling like a Texan. Uh, we'll have a couple feral pig uh, management companies there showing off their products to help with feral management. Um, eradication and control and so forth like that. So it's going to be a great time. Plus you get free barbecue on Thursday night after the welcome uh, cooked by the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. And that's going to be brisket and sausage with all the sides. That's included with your $40 now. In addition to breakfast and lunch on Friday with all the vendors there that you can visit with, find out the latest and greatest in ag market and technology and so forth and get some valuable information from qualified speakers from uh, from Texas A&M, from uh, uh, chemical companies, from seed rep companies, from uh, USDA on programs and services. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to email me or call me or anybody at the office can help you. Um, it's a great deal. Come on out. You can come just to one day if you want on the Friday and not the Thursday or you can come for both days, come and get some barbecue and then come get your classes on Thursday, uh, Friday. So uh, hope to see you all there. And again, register by the 22nd for that $250 drawing for the gift card. We're going to give one of those away on Thursday, uh, September 30th. So uh, with that being said, the last slide is my resources for my interview with Butter the Dairy Cow. Uh, you can review those if you have any questions for me. Uh, you can always get in touch with me by email. Um, I didn't put it here, but if Paul or Brandy want to type it in the box, shannon.deets at ag.tamu.edu. I enjoyed the presentation, guys. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed it as well. And um, with that being done, have a great weekend. Uh, cooler weather is on the way, so don't give up and um, drink some milk. Have a great day.